Hi everyone, Cindy Fan here, and welcome back to another episode of Who Beats, where we challenge you to solve diagnostically difficult real-world cases alongside experienced clinicians. As always, I'm here with my partner, Dr. Zhang Huang. Hey everyone. So if you remember, over the last few episodes, we've been trying different formats to spice things up. Last episode, we presented a case in a very reduced format. With a sequentially provided chunks of information, and we had multiple discussants tackling the case together. And for this episode, we are going to try something different too. This time, our discussant is going to tackle not one, not two, but three cases. Again, the cases are very short, and only the bare minimum information is provided for each one. At the end of this episode, the diagnoses for all three cases will be revealed. Of course, not until we hear from our discussant first. Without further ado, let us hear the first case from our very own chief executive producer, Core AM, Dr. Shreya Trivedi. All right. So the information for our first case: we have a 66-year-old male who presents with abdominal pain for about two days. It's right upper quadrant pain, worse when he moves, worse when he takes a deep breath, and associated with some nausea. His past medical history: he has asthma; it's mild, intermittent, obstructive sleep apnea. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia. His social history: he's a 45-pack year smoker. Quit about five years ago. Vital signs: he's afebrile, heart rate 94, blood pressure 144 over 74, breathing at 18, 96% on room air, and 81 kilograms. His exam is significant for right lower lobe rails and right CVA tenderness. His chest X-ray. He has small atelectasis at the lung base. The rest of exam, though, and his rest of his labs, admission labs, are normal. And that's all the information you'll get for the first case. I know it's not a lot to go on, but what would you have said if you were our expert discussant? Make sure to pause, give yourself room for some active thinking, and we'll compare notes after the break. Welcome back. This week, Zhang and I sat down with Dr. David Kadowitz, a hyper internist who is both a hospitalist and a primary care provider at NYU. Let's see what he thinks about this case. As usual, he is getting exactly the same information you are getting, and nothing more. The more that I learn about medicine, the more that I realize that what we mostly see are classic or typical presentations of. Typical diseases or atypical presentations of typical diseases. So I, that's how I separated my differential diagnosis here. So first, when you're thinking about typical presentations of typical diseases, something like just a musculoskeletal type of back pain comes up. There's no history of trauma, and then you start to think of all the other types of things that can give you right upper quadrant pain: biliary colic. Again, not associated with food. Acute cholecystitis. Again, there's no fever, and The pain is mostly、um, with inspiration, cholangitis. There's no jaundice, hepatitis. The labs are normal. There's no ascites. I think even you know, more interestingly, pneumonia is something that comes up to me, especially with the right upper quadrant pain and you know the the atelectasis that's there. But again, there's there is no fever. But you know, like I said, there are atypical presentations of typical diseases. Thinking about kidney pathology, so to me, this fits very well with pyelonephritis and a kidney stone because the patient has nausea. But again, there's no fever, and assumingly, there's no blood on on the UA, which would be key for a diagnosis of a kidney stone. Finally, the patient's a smoker, so could this atelectasis be disguising a lung cancer of some sort? I don't think that's probable here. That's you know just starting to talk about some of the typical things that this may or may not be atypical things or atypical presentations of typical diseases is where I went to next and I thought of a few different things here. So the first thing that I thought of was was actually a pulmonary embolism. So the patient has borderline tachycardia, borderline hypoxia. They have this risk of a possible cancer now. Smoking puts you at risk for more than just lung cancer; puts you at risk for other cancers as well. The acuteness of this picture also makes PE more likely. And could this atelectasis be、uh, disguising an infarct of some sort, which is causing the pain? Which again we describe as pl- pleuritic, but in the abdomen. The Wells score is zero, but I think there's at least enough evidence here to send a D-dimer. 
Another thought would be perhaps a renal infarct. Again, I don't see any risk factors for a renal infarct. There's no history of cardiac disease. There's no AFib. Two other quick things that I thought about were PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, maybe the Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome, the right upper quadrant, and also a mesenteric ischemia. But again, hard to relate without a little bit more information. That's a relatively long list from not a lot of information. Although,、uh, if you listen closely, it's clearly not a random list. And I think relying on certain tricks, or probably what the literature would call as schemas, right, of how you're thinking, and like, oh, right upper quadrant pain. I go through my all the things in the right upper quadrant, and if those don't fit, then I start thinking about things that aren't in the right upper quadrant that can cause right upper quadrant, like pneumonia, PE. Retroperitoneal stuff. Zhang, remember we mentioned the idea of dynastic hierarchy in one of our previous episodes. Yes, we did.、Uh, we talked about how, when faced with a complex case, experts generally don't jump straight from the raw clinical data to specific diagnoses. They start by characterizing the patient's illness in relatively broad and abstract terms, and often this involves the clinician speculating about which domains are involved in the patient's illness. Domain being a structural or functional component of the human body. These domains could be organs like the heart versus the lungs. They can also be systems like the hematopoietic system, the circulatory system, the immune system, or just an anatomical region of the body, chest versus abdomen. Choosing the correct domain is crucial. It's often the first step in the reasoning process, and it determines the directionality of your reasoning. A lot of diagnostic errors stem from moving to the incorrect domain. That's right, Cindy. For example,、uh, when we encounter a patient with、uh, with dyspnea, I think it's understandable、uh, if we reflexively think, "Well, is it cardiac or is it pulmonary?" And that might be enough to diagnose pneumonia if the patient has fever and a low bar infiltrate. But when that patient fails to be extubated by hospital day three, hospital day four, five, six,、uh, we may only belatedly realize that there were domains we didn't consider. In this case, neurologic. The patient is suffering from a myasthenic flare that was precipitated by their pneumonia. If you think about it. Anemia, metabolic acidosis, hyperthyroidism—we can think about many processes that don't belong to either the cardiac or the pulmonary domains. Another common mistake is thinking that the body is composed of strict, anatomically distinct boxes. It's easy to think in terms of chest versus abdomen as above or below the diaphragm, but in reality, we know that's not the case. An epigastric pain can often be MIs. Splenic infarcts may present as left lower chest pain. Anatomy 101 in med school: left shoulder pain could be referred diaphragmatic irritation.、Mm-hmm. I know these are probably things we've all been taught, but it's nice to see how Dr. Kudlowitz models that for us here. Right? His rule of thumb: when a symptom is close to the diaphragm, make sure to think about what's on the other side of that diaphragm too. So, a patient with right upper quadrant pain. Thinking about the liver and the biliary tree is obvious, but can't forget the lower chest and the retroperitoneal space as well. Considering each and all of these domains, that's what allowed him to come up with a robust list of specific diagnoses that he did: biliary colic, pulmonary embolism, renal infarcts, etc. All right, let's stop seeing praises. We all know Dr. Cottowitz is brilliant and definitely not paying us to say this on air. <laughs> no, definitely not, Cindy. You and I are just. Not important enough, exactly, <laughs> to, to have that kind of influence. And also, we do have to move on, unfortunately,、uh, to case two. And I'm sorry, I know it's frustrating、uh, to leave、uh, leave this patient without a diagnosis, but、uh, <laughs> deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Delayed gratification is a good virtue for a、uh, internist to have. And for our second case, we have a 41-year-old male who's referred from pre-op clinic for AFib with RVR. So he was at pre-op clinic because he has bilateral wrist fractures from a trip and a fall that happened about a week ago. His history is pretty unremarkable in terms of past medical, surgical, family, social history. Not on any meds. In terms of vital signs, he's afebrile, heart rate of 156. Blood pressure one twenty two over seventy six, 
breathing at 16, satting 99% on room air, and weighing 97 kilograms. His exam? His wrists are in soft casts. He is tachycardic. His EKG shows AFib slash flutter with RVR. And his chest x-ray shows no overt edema or pneumonia, maybe some possible vascular congestion exacerbated by shallow inspiration. All right, listeners, you should know the drill by now. Pause, think, come up with your own differential. We'll play some relaxing music in the background. All right, 41-year-old man here with new onset atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Again, Dr. Kudlowitz. First question, why does such a young guy have AFib? Second question, why is he 97 kilograms and what's his BMI? And my third question is, how did he get, how did he fall? How does a guy who's 41 just trip and fall and break both of his wrists? I'm very uneasy with sending this patient to surgery. And then I'm uneasy for three reasons. Number one, am I satisfied that this is AFib that's idiopathic and not related to anything else or just related to his obesity? Number two, did he just trip and fall and happen to break both of his wrists? Does he actually just need a good primary care doctor and a DEXA scan when all this is over? Or did he actually syncopize? And then finally, if he is going to go to surgery, I think, you know, figuring out what his rate control medication is going to be is very important. And as far as I know, he doesn't have diabetes. So, you know, his CHADS VASC is probably zero and, and he doesn't need anything like anticoagulation perioperatively. To answer Dr. Kadawa's question, we sent a medical student into the patient's room and thoroughly interrogated him for an hour. It was definitely a mechanical fall, and the wrist fractures were a result of both the very crowded environment and very bad luck. I mean, it makes sense for him to come in with tachycardia, right? He broke his wrist, he's probably in a lot of pain, maybe a lot of anxiety with going through surgery. I'm not really 100% satisfied as to why he could possibly have AFib at 41 years old. Like, you know, I think it it is very possible that it it could just be idiopathic. And I think we have enough evidence here to at least check a TSH, which maybe you have for me. But, um, you know, as far as doing further testing, I think uh, a chest um, X-ray is reasonable here as well, which we have. No, no overt pneumonia, possible vascular congestion, which I read as actually obesity. Right, he's not taking a deep breath, and he, he probably has a lot of fat, subcutaneous tissue. At least putting on my hospitalist hat, you know, anytime someone has new AFib, PE always crosses my mind. So I don't see why it wouldn't cross my mind in the clinic. To be fair, you do occasionally see this uh, young, healthy patient who comes in with new AFib for no apparent reason and with no evidence of structural heart disease. Uh, Lone AFib, as it's called, is a well-described entity. I wonder what made him immediately skeptical. Is it a spidey sense going off? Um, I don't know if I'm good enough to rely on my spidey sense yet. I I like to try and rely on my spidey sense, but... When I try and rely on that, I feel like it's sometimes getting getting lazy. Uh, Or, you know, it's not really feeling lazy. It's really actually just being overworked and tired and, and, you know, trying to take a mental break when I can. And and that's that's a dangerous path to fall in. And that's a recurrent thing that reminds me of many of our prior episodes. The way expert clinicians habitually ask themselves, what doesn't fit? What else can it be? It might take years of experience to hone my system one and pattern recognition for my spidey sense to become reliable. But getting into the habit of questioning myself is something I can start doing today. I agree, Cindy. And uh, unfortunately, I think there's a lot more we can say uh, about this case, but we're going to have to move on uh, to our third case. And again, we'll we'll get to the answers uh, at the end of this episode. And last but not least, we have a 50-year-old male who's here for... Tremor and syncope that happened on the day of admission. So he was sitting at his work desk. He smelt some burnt toast, felt dizzy, and lost consciousness. Of note, he had a similar admission about a month ago and was treated for alcohol withdrawal. His past medical history otherwise is hypertension and COPD. Social history, 
Uh, He has three vodka drinks daily and is a current everyday smoker. More objective data, he's afebrile, heart rate of 97, blood pressure 141 over 89, breathing at 14, satting 96% on room air, and weighing 59 kilograms. On exam, he has a mild hand tremor, and the rest of his admission labs are within normal limits. Listeners, you know what to do. Enjoy the music. So to me, initial thoughts. So weird smell plus loss of consciousness is not a, it's not syncope to me. It's a seizure to me until proven otherwise. So the, I, I'm surprised that the patient didn't get an EEG or we didn't hear about the EEG from the, from um, the last admission if the presenting symptoms were similar. So it says that he was treated for withdrawal. For, but he drinks three vodka drinks per day. So having trained at Bellevue, three shots of vodka is not enough to cause alcohol withdrawal. So I'm wondering if, you know, these were actually just like, you know, big glasses of vodka that he was drinking. Uh, but it's very reasonable that, you know, he could have had an alcohol withdrawal seizure. Um, this time, this, you know, kind of burnt toast smell, which leads me towards seizure, but then dizziness kind of makes me think, maybe a little bit more cardiac and hey maybe did this patient have have an arrhythmia uh possibly as well here um and prior to the, prior to his syncope uh other thing or seizure which which i'm going to talk a little bit more about so for me what i fall back on here is syncope and what's my differential diagnosis for syncope and since we see syncope quite often i have a specific way that i think about it so the first it's divided into four parts so the first part is uh, what I'm thinking about my differential diagnosis for syncope is, number one, not syncope. So all the things that are not syncope that we include in our syncope category when we're talking about the differential. And the first one, of course, is a seizure. Um, hypoglycemia, intoxication. Um, you know, there's this also this thing that I like to bring up, especially when I'm teaching people for tuberal uh, basal insufficiency, which the only way I'm able to remember what that is is because it's also called beauty parlor syndrome. Well, you tell. So you like lean your head back like this, uh, and you yeah, and you and you um you occlude those vertebral arteries, makes you very dizzy, and, and you can syncopize. And then finally, my favorite not syncope cause of syncope is sleeping, <laughs> which uh, rapid responses have been called for. Um, second category to me is reflex syncope. So lots of people just say vasovagal. I like to say reflex because I include vasovagal in that, but I also include um, situational syncope like uh, coughing, micturition, etc. Third is orthostasis, which is usually due to um, hypovolemia medications or neuro- underlying neurologic disease. And four is a big category and it's cardiac. So uh, arrhythmias, myocardial diseases, structural diseases. Uh, third is valvular disease, and fourth would be an obstructive type of disease like a tamponade or, or PE, uh, something that's causing hypoxia. There was that study that was was debatably done very well or not well, um, where you know one out of six people who are admitted to the hospital for undifferentiated syncope have a PE. Um, but the question is, was that study too biased or were there a lot of those incidental findings? So this patient had loss of consciousness and, you know, did, did uh, this patient have a PE? Look at how he frames the problem. We told him it's syncope, but syncope isn't just a symptom. It's also kind of a diagnosis. By labeling it syncope, we're essentially saying the cause of this man's loss of consciousness is hypoperfusion of the brain. Dr. Kudlowitz recognizes it's premature to make that assumption. So he approaches this as transient loss of consciousness. Oh, by the way, I really love the diagnostic schema he had for syncope. When he's convinced that it is, in fact, syncope? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. It's very similar to the one we all learned in med school, but you can tell he's inherited the bare scaffolds of an old building and added additional extra wings and rooms to it. As he learns more from uh, additional experience and patient exposure and reading. And that's something I strive to do for all the common problems I see. So to recap, 
we presented our discussant with three patients, 66-year-old man with significant smoking history here with acute abdominal pain, 41-year-old man with obesity and recent wrist fractures here for new asymptomatic AFib, and a 50-year-old man with smoking and alcohol use here for recurrent syncope. Dr. Kudlowitz, as you heard, uh, gave a thoughtful and robust differential diagnosis for each of these cases. But as it turns out in the end, he concluded that the diagnosis was the same in all three cases. So, Cindy, do you want to tell us what happened? Well, in the first case, the 41-year-old man with acute abdominal pain underwent a cast skin of the abdomen with contrast and was incidentally found to have an acute low bar pulmonary embolism. A dedicated PE study confirmed the low bar PE, a right lower lobe uh, pulmonary infarction, and with a pulmonary mass highly concerning for invasive carcinoma. Yikes, that's not good. Yep. Um, the patient with wrist fractures and new AFib with rapid ventricular response, you guessed it, bilateral low bar PEs. So why did that patient have PEs? Well, the patient reported relative immobility and chair bound status for, for a week or so because his wrists were broken and he couldn't go to work and do his usual um, task. You got to wonder though, is that enough to cause a n- acute DVT and PE? Or is it more like what Dr. Kadawa said, um, that obesity plays a bigger role here? Huh, I see what you did there. <laughs> My understanding is that upper extremity fractures uh, have a weak association with venous thromboembolism, but uh, the incidence thing seems to be highest with humeral and clavicular fractures. It's very rare uh, in patients with wrist fractures, and uh, I'm not sure, again, if it's just because of the inactivity that it encourages or whether there truly is a disturbance in local venous blood flow? I think it's quite interesting, right? I mean, if the patient presented with lower extremity, say a hip fracture, combined with the tachycardia, that would definitely trigger a PE scan uh, for most providers. But with the wrist fracture, I don't know if I would be necessarily sensitive enough to think about PE if I saw this patient in a busy ER myself, especially when there are other factors that could explain his tachycardia. Kudos to the ED physicians who decided to obtain a D-dimer and ultimately a PE scan. Retrieving illness scripts in response to clinical cues, that is a process that is uh, fast, typically uh, basically subconscious. Some authors have argued uh, that the reason why expert clinicians uh, tend to be so successful in triggering the correct scripts through this process is because they tend to focus on the conditions that contribute to or protect against certain diseases, in other words, who the patient is, uh, rather than focusing, fixating unduly on the signs or symptoms, uh, in other words, the minutia of the patient's presentation. Uh, themselves. And conversely, using a rigid, limited illness script is almost like using a stupid search engine. The search results really only come up if you enter the key phrases exactly how you memorized it. I still think this patient got lucky here. If he was, say, 75 years old or had a prior history of atrial fibrillation, his PE really could have been undiagnosed. And Cindy, lastly, what about the patient with recurrent syncope versus seizure episodes? Yep, acute bilateral low bar PE again. It's unclear why he had PE, um, but he is undergoing malignancy workup for some pulmonary nodules on imaging as well as hypercoagulability workup now. I omitted this information to make this case harder for Dr. Kadowitz, but this patient actually had a remote history of DVT. It was unclear what the circumstances were or if he had prior workup, but he had not been taking his anticoagulation in years. Cindy, just to be clear, you said these were all low bar PEs, right? These aren't these crappy subsegmentals that we sometimes come up. Okay, all low bar. All right. Uh, in the third case, it's still unclear if you really could attribute both of the syncopal episodes to PE, right? He could still have a primary seizure disorder? I, I completely agree. Um, but I still love how on admission, the hospitalist thought his symptoms just didn't fit the alcohol history or the diagnosis of withdrawal seizure and decided to 
PE scan him. Um, not necessarily all providers, even provided with the history of DVT, um, will have pulled the trigger. And that's why I included the case here. So, yeah, I intentionally collected three middle-aged men with PE who presented very differently to trick Dr. Cottawood, um, but it was still too easy for him. Can I pick this mic up and drop it? For those of you who might be getting the wrong impression about Dr. Kudlowitz, he's actually incredibly modest and humble. Uh, he did not drop the mic. I do wonder, how did Dr. Kudlowitz arrive at the diagnosis of PE so effortlessly in these three cases? I'm always surprised by a diagnosis of PE, and I'm often annoyed by a diagnosis of PE. I feel like PE is the classic. Well, I think what's what's interesting is you read these three cases separately, you don't necessarily think of PE, but when you read them together, you try and you try and put a thread through them. It's not my um, bad experiences, or or you know, uh, or things that have happened to me, but it's things that have happened to other people. As far as, you know, PE always being an, an M&M, yeah. uh, it makes you very hyper aware of, of this as a possible diagnosis. Well, now we all know what the diagnosis is. Let's come back to the discussion of typical versus atypical presentation of diseases. In an ideal world, all patients with pulmonary embolism should just read the textbook and present with dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, tachycardia, hypoxia, and maybe occasionally trace hemoptysis, right? But what happens when they forget to read the textbook? I guess my bigger question is, is there a legit diagnostic strategy I can use, say, gathering a list of diagnoses that tend to have variable presentation and tend to trick people up and use that list as a cheat sheet? Actually, a lot of sense. Uh, you know, if you remember from past episodes, you know, we featured some diseases that, you know, tend to have multi organ involvement, hyperthyroidism, tuberculosis. Uh, there's a, seems to be a, a group of uh, diseases that are notorious for atypical presentations. Well, now after this episode, I'm going to add PE to my list. It's not a multi organ process, but it can definitely look like many different other things. You know, when I first heard of this phrase, the great imitator in medical school, it was just a few select entities. Now it's TB, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, lupus, Lyme, PE, thyroid disorders, leptospirosis. The list goes on and on now. Yep. I think you just listed the differential for CPCs and M&Ms. And uh, I mean, it seems like every conference you go to or a case report you read about these things, uh, take-home messages always, remember to keep a high index of suspicion for XYZ. Well, how am I supposed to keep a high index of suspicion for so many different things at the same time? I mean, I guess keeping a list of differential to watch out for uh, might work for other clinicians, but it's not really working out for me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Instead of having a list of offending diseases, is it then a legit strategy to just think harder about certain types of patients who tend to present atypically? Let's say um, geriatric patients who never develop dysuria, fever, leukocytosis when they have a UTI. Uh, again, I get what you're saying. Uh, it's like how we you know, are always taught to be careful with diabetics or women who present with things like nausea or gas pain, you know, because they might end up having an MI. Or medications. I always remember my Crohn's disease patient getting high-dose steroids, developed C. diff toxic megacolon overnight and perf, was not screaming in pain, had a, such a subtle abdominal exam, was not the typical rigid belly we all learn, um, almost missed that perforation. Cindy, I acknowledge this strategy is useful, but again, uh, it seems only useful up to a point. I mean, as our paranoia increases, I think we could justify adding more and more groups of patients to this list. I mean, you mentioned a patient, your patient on steroids. Well, what about patients who are immunosuppressed for other reasons? They have a transplant. They have AIDS. They have CVID. They're just malnourished. Or they have a hematologic cancer. What about <laughs> every patient who doesn't speak English as a first language? 
uh, every patient who has a psychiatric diagnosis. And at a certain point, I think the uh, the list of people to worry about just becomes too long to be useful.、Uh, to make this strategy even harder to adapt, these patients don't necessarily tell you they are part of this high risk group for a typical presentations.、Um, they don't necessarily tell you upfront like they have undiagnosed. Diabetes or metastatic malignancy—that's just annoying. So I guess it's true that I do want to watch out for atypical presentations in these patient populations. But as a general strategy, it's not working out for me either. I also want to point out. I mean, in this episode, we've got what three middle-aged, baseline healthy.、Uh, I'm going to presume they're English-speaking males. So the above factors aren't even at play. Which I think brings us back to the importance of illness scripts, of building and developing and maintaining robust illness scripts. I think the problem the problem is with these、um, these typical diseases, right? So you separate everything to typical and atypical diseases, like we've been talking about, right? So like PE is a typical disease, but something like GPA for me is an atypical disease. So my illness script for an atypical disease that I haven't seen as much or I have less experience with is very small. Uh, almost like you know, for instance, a medical student's illness script would be for a typical disease. So for me, since PE is a typical disease and I've seen it a lot, the illness script is huge. It's more than just someone who recently has surgery or is tachycardic and hypoxic and has pleuritic chest pain,、um, and you know, S one Q three T three. It's it's more than that. It's It's、um, someone who has something wrong with them, but you can't necessarily figure out what it is. It is not necessarily obvious from just all the information that you have. I don't. So I I think my illness scripts are organized in groups of illness scripts. So I actually think that I'm a big believer in、um, horizontal reading. So. Taking several diseases that have similarities,、um, and taking each of their illness scripts and comparing the components of their illness scripts to one another. And I think it's important to know which disease entities are common to us, and we know which illness scripts need to be worked on. Once we build our illness scripts based on the most typical presentation, we need to continue to expand and adapt to incorporate the. A typical presentations. I mean, illness script building should be an ongoing process throughout our training, even for the disease entities that we think we know well.、Mm-hmm. An ongoing process and an active one. Recurring theme, I think, in in the episodes that we've done. We can't just rely on seeing cases. And being an inexperienced novelist myself, I'm hoping my conscious effort in the process can speed things up. While I'm still trying to gain on patient exposure, reading case reports, going to conferences, talking to my colleagues, and、um, gathering cool cases, the focus is not just learning some exoteric disease entities I've never heard of before, but also to learn how a typical presentations of certain things can still trick me. All right, listeners, that should do it for this episode. Just to recap, this week we had three previously healthy middle-aged men presenting with abdominal pain, AFib with rapid rate, and recurrent syncope. All three have one diagnosis in common: pulmonary embolism. Something we see commonly, an entity I learned to respect, and I still think is very sexy. Speak for yourself, Cindy. I am so over PE. Cindy and I、uh, hope you'll join us next time. We're going to keep experimenting with these different case formats.、Uh, let us know if you like the twists that we've been making, or if you hate them. <laughs> More constructively, if you have a case you'd like to submit for discussion, or someone you'd like to come on and hear as a discussant, or if you're interested in developing an episode, please get in touch with us. Visit our website at www.coreimpodcast.com. Or send us an email at hello at coreimpodcast dot com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at at coreimpodcast. Thank you to Dr. David Cardowitz for weighing in on this episode. Special thanks to our audio editor for this episode, Richard Chin, along with our Coreim colleagues Shira Sachs, Shreya Trivedi, 
Marty Fried, Amy O, and an honorable mention as always to Dr. Stephen Liu. Opinions expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent the opinions of NYU or other affiliated institutions, nor should they be construed as medical advice. Thank you for joining us with Core I Am. I'm Cindy Fain. You deserve a tech career you love. Coworkers you can count on. Innovation you're proud to build. If you're ready to change the world through technology, explore a career at Cox. Make a real impact in engineering, development, cybersecurity, and more. All while experiencing work-life balance, flexible work options, and great benefits. Visit cox.career/tech to find a job you love today. That's cox.career/tech. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over thirty thousand mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over six hundred dollars each week. You can also save up to one dollar off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply.